I'm told we're live at Healthcare Triage. Sorry we're late. We've had we've had a day here. Um, script misplacement, running out of time. You don't want to hear it. Let's get let's just get going. Anyway, Healthcare Triage Live. Support us on Patreon if you can. That's all we'll do. Here we go. Christina L. What is your opinion of free public access to research articles? So it's so funny you mentioned this because um, Austin Frack and I have actually talked about doing an up and back on this to, to post in, in the New York Times because there's a good debate here. So a lot of people think all the research should be free. It should be posted in online access journals and everything's fine. I buy that argument when the research is funded with public money because the idea that, that money should fund uh, should fund the research but then everybody can't go look at it, that public money, that doesn't seem right. Um, on the other hand, there have been changes, so that, that already does happen. Sometimes there's just like a year lag or something until the stuff is public. But even then, I, I don't know. The problem is that it, it costs money to do the publication, the journals and everything else. It costs money for the infrastructure to publish, to do the peer review. And the way they often get paid is by subscriptions. Um, otherwise, it's often by advertisements. But then everybody argues that that's a conflict of interest because if a drug company is paying the journal, maybe they're more likely to you know, publish positive stuff for that kind of that drug company. So a simpler way is often to do subscriptions. That, of course, forces people out. But we have to pay for this somehow. So I don't have a good answer. One is open access journals, which require, basically, when I want to publish in an open access journal, I have to pay. But, you know, where do I get that money as a researcher? Therefore, only, like, rich researchers at rich universities can do it? What if I conduct good research on a shoestring and I can't afford the open access payments? Then, then it, So this is not the easiest question in the world. I'm sympathetic to the arguments. I get why we should have research open. I'm in favor of everyone being able to see everything. I do not have an easy answer about how we should pay for that. And I think that the people that call for everything should be free and open, everyone have got to grapple with that and come up with some sort of solution with real world money that would allow that to happen. Gideon Taylor asks, I was wondering what cognitive symptoms of mild, moderate, and severe dehydration were. I wish I could remember these off the top of my head. I would say probably that mild dehydration shouldn't have much cognitive symptoms. I mean, dehydration, first of all, when we use it clinically, is severe. I mean, like you're talking like 5 to 10% of your body weight of water gone. Like that's real dehydration. And so that, we, what we call dehydration is not really dehydration. If you're seeing cognitive response like problems that's dehydration get you know call the doctor or do a call you know get get them to the to get them help that's real dehydration there's probably a scale or a system to figure that out i wish i knew it off the top of my head um but we could go look that up megan jacqueline i got my flu shot yesterday and out of curiosity in a google search led me to report saying that the 2015 to 16 cycle has been 60 percent effective is that good seems less than impressive it's that's such a great question, and it's a complicated answer. I, this is the thing. If, I, if we wanted to be boring, I could literally go read you a blog post I wrote last year which discusses this exact thing. And if you will tweet me, I will send you the link to that post. 60% effectiveness is not terrible. It's better than you'd imagine. Um, but it's not perfect. The number needed to treat, even when you're down at 60%, though, is still in, like, a reasonable range. It's not like the hundreds or even thousands that I think we see with some drugs that we use. Um, it is effective. It's not as effective as we would like, but it is effective. And that 60% effective doesn't mean that like you got a 60 or 40% chance of getting the flu. The numbers and the math are complicated. And you should go look at my post or you should tweet me and I will absolutely send you there. Garants the kid, why most universal healthcare coverage doesn't cover teeth? Treating my cavities is part of my health as much as treating the flu. Yeah, yes. I don't know, because we're idiots in the United States sometimes, and we don't consider things that are like common sense health to be there. For kids, it's law that there has to be in the exchanges some dental coverage offered. You know, cavities are the number one chronic disease of childhood. Just are. We don't seem to care. Um, even when those dental plans are offered, um, they are not often you know, affordable for everyone. Um, and we we used to do this with mental health too. We used to think that like mental health wasn't health, therefore we didn't really cover it. Laws changed, now it is. I expect someday we'll get there with dentistry and, and teeth health as well, but we're certainly not there yet. Sentius Deus, is there any good research on moderate to heavy weightlifting increasing bone density? And if it is, is this possibly a good way to decrease bone fractures in the general population? No, as far as I know, there isn't. This is the thing, you can actually, 
prevent accidents and falls with moderate or mild, you know, very low levels of activity. You don't need to be a heavy lifter to get improvements in the chance of like falls and fractures. Actually, just strength, you know, just muscle, you know, just some training often helps. We've, we've covered this actually because they even looked at vitamin D and they looked at mild exercise. I covered this in a piece I recently wrote in an episode. I think we really did just recently, a news episode on vitamin D. You know, exercise will help the elderly prevent falls and fractures, but, but you know, vitamin D doesn't. Um, but you don't have to do like moderate to heavy weightlifting. That's probably overkill and not necessary for most people. Terrytown, how do they make glasses for babies? I have to read a teeny line to get glasses, but they make them just for babies. Okay, so a couple things here. One, you don't have to read a line. Even little kids, they can do symbols. So you don't have to have a letter to do a test. You can say triangle, square, so you can get low. Babies, on the other hand, one of two things could be happening. One is they can do reasonably good refraction tests these days just with machines. Um, where they can just sit you down, have you look at a thing, and actually just tell what your refraction is. The other thing is that you should know, not all babies are being corrected for like 20-20 vision. Sometimes when we're doing baby stuff, it's to strength, you know, to, to make one eye, because eyes are not equal, um, and that's one could be more developed than the other, and we basically screw up, or sometimes even patch, the, the strong eye to make the weak eye work better to bring it up. That's sometimes you do with like amblyopia and things like that. Um, or we could be correct, creating or changing something else. My son Jacob had to wear glasses when he was little because um, he had an, originally an asymmetric red reflex, but basically he had some kind of differential thing with his eyes and they needed to correct it. Um, and he doesn't wear glasses now. He outgrew that problem. It wasn't for he couldn't see 2020. It was for something completely different. Um, and so then it's not necessary necessarily to measure their perfect refraction to try to get them to 2020. Christina L. Are all prenatal vitamins created equally? Some are five bucks, some are 20 bucks. What's the difference? 15 bucks. You like that? Um, no. Most of the time, as long as you're getting the, the, the complete set and full H, you're good. And I don't know what they're putting into that extra 15 bucks other than probably expensive urine. Um, but uh, if the $5 one doesn't have the folate, then I would be concerned because that's, that's often what we're really talking about. Um, so talk to your doctor about what they think the difference is, certainly. And if it doesn't sound right, email me or, you know, send me a tweet and I'll try to look into that specifically for you. But, uh, you know, you, usually with respect to vitamins, this is what I talk about all the time. When you're talking about taking a multivitamin, which most people don't even need, you know, the cheap one by the barrel at Costco is all you need. Anything else you take above that, it's, you're just peeing it out. It doesn't make a difference. Jonathan Finelli, I've had cough going on for three months now, and the doctor's fine. I have low potassium in my blood work and nothing on my x-ray. Should I go to another hospital for their opinion? Uh, I'm not going to give you medical advice, dude. Plus, it's like I don't know why you're going to a hospital um, instead of a doctor's office. Maybe, maybe you just met another clinic. I also don't know what blood tests they're doing for your cough. I mean, there's lots of things that could be cough. And I'm not giving you medical advice, but lots of things could be cough. And allergies could cause cough. Asthma could cause cough. You know, uh, reactive airway, disease, which is really just saying asthma in another way. Is cough. So it's not necessarily going to be something that's going to show up in x-ray or it's not going to be an infection. So they need to work that up properly. You should talk to your healthcare provider about the differential diagnosis of cough. What else it could be? Three months seems like a long time. Alexis is peachy. Advice on how to explain to friends, family that they don't know how to treat themselves better than doctors do. Yeah. Say that. Um, although I would also say it's like, what are they treating? If it's a cold, doesn't matter. You know, symptomatic care is all you need to do. There's nothing to treat. If they're treating chronic diseases or real medical problems, I, then I might want to check in with a healthcare professional. Um, but in general, that's what doctors are trained to do. And if you're not going to trust them, okay. Uh, but there's a reason that I, you know, graduated in the 25th grade to do what I do today. It took a fairly large amount of schooling to get the knowledge I need to do this. And I would hope that most other doctors have learned something along the way as well. Nick Sullivan, I move all the time for school or work, so I'm constantly changing healthcare providers and I don't have a regular physician. How am I supposed to keep track of my medical history? Well, okay, in an ideal world, first of all, there'd be electronic medical records, so this wouldn't matter. But it's probably a good idea to get your doctor when you leave them, to, for them to give you a printout or summary of your, your medical record. Um, it, they may charge you a couple bucks for the Xeroxing, but they'll do it. Um, and then you carry it for the next one. I used to just keep, 
I mean, I have ulcerative colitis, so I, I knew I had like some history that needed to be maintained. I had a file and I just kept it. And every time I went to a new doctor, I'd give them the, the file and sometimes they'd update it and I'd have many copies of it. Um, unfortunately, we live in a world where individual patients have to do this for themselves. In an ideal world, this would be done for you by some sort of EMR or anything else. But that's the good way uh, to do it. Megan Jacqueline again comes says, for another healthy person, is there any good reason to endure a headache as opposed to knocking back some paracetamol, Tylenol for Americans, ibuprofen, aspirin? No. I mean, why, why would you want to tolerate pain? I mean, you don't want to get addicted. I, I should say addicted, even though it's not addiction. You don't want to overdose on these things. Um, you certainly don't want to be drinking a lot and using Tylenol because liver problems can be an issue. Um, you don't want to take too much ibuprofen because it can have chronic GI or stomach issues and, and pain and bleeding. But no, if I have a headache, I absolutely take medication for it. Now, if you have tons of headaches, you want to talk to your doctor because if it's chronic, that could be a reason for something in the long term. But for an acute headache, local, then absolutely no reason not to treat it. Uh, if it's the worst headache of your life, super severe, you should call and get real help. But again, for a mild headache that you're having at home, why would you suffer? I can't think of a good reason. Tiva Pox asks, what is Tetralogy of Fallot? Uh, my nephew has it and nobody can explain it to me very well. So Tetralogy of Fallot is a complex congenital heart defect. So some babies are born with it. And it has basically four features. The first is a ventricular septal defect. And it's usually pretty large. What that means is that there is a opening between the two ventricles. So remember the heart, maybe we're going way back here, the heart, Two atrium, two ventricles. The blood comes from, uh, let's say, comes from the body, and it goes into the, oh my God, this is where I'm gonna kill myself here. The uh, right ventricle, and then it's pumped, I mean the right atrium, then it's pumped in the right ventricle, then out to the lungs where it gets oxygenated, then back to the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, then out to the body. So the two ventricles, one of them has oxygenated blood and one of them does not. A large ventricular septal defect means that that blood is mixing. So the blood that's getting out to the body is not as oxygenated as you would like. That's defect number one. Defect number two is pulmonary stenosis. The, uh, the vessel that's going from the heart to, to the lungs is narrowed, and it's much harder for it to get the blood out there. That's a problem. Three, right, you get right ventricular hypertrophy. So it's, the heart has to work so hard to push the blood through that narrow ventric, the, that narrowed pulmonary stenosis, the pulmonary artery, that it gets enlarged. Because if the muscle's working so hard, it gets bigger. Because muscle, that's how muscles work. When you work your muscles, they get bigger. So you get right ventricular hypertrophy because it's gotten too large. And then finally, you have what we call an overriding aorta. The aorta is supposed to just sit over one of the ventricles. So pure oxygen, you know, blood, come, fully oxygenated blood is coming out. An overriding aorta is sort of covering both ventricles, sort of. So again, you're getting this mix of oxygen. So you've got, again, four problems. The large VSD, the pulmonary stenosis, the right ventricular hypertrophy, and the overriding aorta. All four of those, unfortunately, leave it so that the blood coming out of your heart is not w as well oxygenated as you can like. And with various problems and things that occur, you can get cyanotic and have problems. So they have to do surgery for the most part uh, to fix that. And it's complicated. And I think if I remember, there's a few steps. They do some right after birth, but it, depending upon, a lot of times it depends on the surgery on how bad the pulmonary stenosis is, uh, on how, how many different, now we've improved obviously the surgery quite a bit in the last few decades, but it's a serious problem. It's usually diagnosed in utero and they want to fix it soon after birth. Uh, let's look at the time. We've got time for one more question. Sebastian, actually maybe a few more here. Sebastian, P2 scan, do antibiotics applied to the skin have the same effect as those ingested? I regularly treat skin infections this way, should I stop? Well, they don't have the same effect because obviously one is on the skin and one is, is ingested. So when you take something ingested, it's going everywhere. When you put it just topically, it's just treating that. In general, you want to treat topically when you can, because of course, do as little as possible and get little side effects and effects you don't need. So if you can treat it locally, that's, that's great. Sometimes you can't get rid of skin infections with the topical, and that's when you have to go to the oral antibiotics. But if you can treat it topically, that, that seems totally reasonable. Of course, I never give out healthcare advice on healthcare triage, you should talk to your doctor. Last question, Jen. 4F, hi, Dr. Carroll, Olympics in Brazil, should it be canceled because of Zika? <laughs> Somebody wrote yes, I don't know if that's, if that's part of your question or not. I don't know. 
That is such a great question. The problem is that it's like, I don't know how we're going to, you know, there are lots of other places. Where, I mean, the United States, Zika is becoming more and more prevalent and we're getting panicked about it here too. I don't have an answer for you. I can't run the numbers and do the calculation. I know that if my wife were pregnant with, with, a, with one of our babies right now, I'd be concerned about sending her to a Zika endemic area because the risk of infection is reasonably pretty high. This thing seems easily transmitted and, you know, pretty benign. It's one of those kinds of things for other people. And the risks of, of uh, this seems like a, you know, a risk, a real problem. We're not sure what it is. And I don't have all the answers. So I personally would panic. But, you know, on the other hand, I don't know whether we cancel the Olympics. People have trained their whole lives. You know, there's a lot of economy and everything that goes into scale. I don't know. I wish I had a good answer for you. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of articles and discussions about it. And when other people have done analyses and there's stuff that we can compare and analyze and talk about, it might make a good episode for Healthcare Triage. Thank you everyone for tuning in for our shortened but excellent, I hope, uh, episode of Healthcare Triage news. Um, again, support us on Patreon if you can, patreon.com slash healthcare triage. You can always get merch, hctmerch.com. You can check out the Facebook page, Facebook facebook.com slash healthcare triage. Tune in Fridays for news, Mondays for the episodes, lots of exciting stuff coming up in the future. Thanks for your support.